Hi everyone, it's MJ, the fellow actuary, and welcome to the second philosophy vlog for the year of 2023. We're going to try and do one of these per month, and it's an interesting format because when I try write philosophically, that sounds such a such a pretentious thing to say, but when I do try and write it, I find that I'm always rereading what I've just said and being like, oh, is that right? You know, could I have put it in a better way where I find that if I just talk and, you know, go off on it, it gives a little bit more more freedom. Of course, it means it's not as structured and hopefully that is actually beneficial, comes across more conversational rather than, you know, some heavy philosophical writing that you have to like read, think about and slowly digest. This can hopefully be a more free-flowing format. Um, in the last video, we spoke about um, Rousseau and, and Augustine and how they both wrote a book called Confession. Augustine's view was that people are bad and society improves them, where Rousseau had the exact opposite. People are born good and society corrupts them. And if you're interested in hearing more about that, then I'd recommend going and checking out the first vlog, which we released uh, at the end of, of January. Um, but yeah, what I want to talk about, I guess, in this vlog is, well, I guess, y'all, yeah, the one thing that's, that I've just found very curious my, my whole life is this idea of astrology and astronomy. And sometimes I've been in some awkward situations because I sometimes get the two terms confused. Like someone will be like, oh, I'm into astrology. And then I'm thinking they're talking about astronomy. And I'm like, yeah, me too. You know, oh, what's this? What's this? And then I hear that they're like talking about something completely different. And I'm like, oh, oh, I'm into the, the scientific one. And, and I always found that very interesting, you know, like how astronomy from my own personal perspective was always seen as superior to astrology if, if anything i grew up being taught that you know astrology was a pseudoscience at best that astrology um is is wrong you know just to put out that blanket blanket statement that's that's the world that i kind of grew up in um and just for those i mean i'm Hopefully we all, all don't make the same mistake as me with confusing the terms, but astronomy is the study of, of the cosmos, whereas astrology is trying to divine or, or I guess determine the future by looking at, uh, at the stars and all the other celestial objects and saying, okay, Jupiter's over there, therefore you can have a, have a good day kind of vibe. And... Why I find it interesting is because I also self-identify as a very religious person, as a man of faith, you know, in the sense that I believe that Jesus died and rose again and that all the miracles of the Bible are true and, and that kind of thing. And it's, it's interesting holding that position when one looks at both astronomy and astrology because I am well aware that your astronomers or your scientists look at religion and like, come on, you know, that's all wrong or it's just stories, it's just make-believe and they, they see religion as being inferior. And it's, it's interesting because that's almost the same mindset that I'm having with astrology. You know, I'm looking at it and being like, oh, come on guys, this all make-believe, it's wrong. You know, it's, it's inferior. And I guess that's what I want to talk about in, in this video is, is understanding how these things give us various frameworks and um, I guess yeah, frameworks is, is the nice word to use that help us to structure the reality that we find ourselves in. And I think this is why religion is, is very powerful um, in my own life. It just gives me, you know, a, a sense of stability. It, it really, really is, in my opinion, psychologically healthy to believe in, in an afterlife because it's kind of like it dampens the fear of death. Of course, I'm still scared of death and, you know, what, what awaits, um, but there isn't that dread that goes with it because there is this hope that, you know, life continues just in another realm. Whereas I cannot imagine, you know, the, the anxiety that someone who doesn't believe in an afterlife must, must have when they are confronted with the whole concept of death. And being an actuary and doing all the mathematics around mortality, death is kind of like in our face. And 
it's interesting that while I was at university, quite a lot of the students were leaning towards atheism rather than, than you know, a religious thing. I wouldn't say all of them. I would say, gosh, I never did a, you know, a survey. I probably should have. But it was probably like around 50-50 but the atheists being a lot louder in their, I guess, in their convictions. Um, it's, yeah, uh, Carl Jung mentioned something interesting about atheists. He says, you know, atheists have to keep saying that there is no God, there is no God, as if their words will magically make him, him disappear. And he's got some interesting insights into, into atheists and saying, you know, you're still a theist in a sense that you can't, you know, you're still you know, acknowledging that something has a possibility of existence. And anyway, we're not going to, we're not going to go down that rabbit hole, I guess, for, for today's vlog. Uh, although atheism could maybe be a vlog of the, of the future. Um, I definitely need to, to better prepare for, for that. Um, but yeah, just coming back to this whole, this whole thing with, uh, you know, frameworks of, of reality. And I guess this coincides with, say, another thing that we said in actuarial science, enterprise risk management, where we create a risk framework on which all decisions need to be made through an organization. And having that framework can help an organization survive catastrophes, navigate difficult situations. And I guess for me, religion does that you know, very, very well. It gives me an origin story. It gives me what's going to happen. It gives me a life purpose. You know, it's just, it fills life with meaning. There's this grand narrative that I can participate in. And for me, religion, like I say, is psychologically very, very healthy. And that's why I, I want to consider astrology as I guess, an alternative framework for reality. And I guess for, for a lot of people, it can provide them with that same stability. Um, and I guess, you know, we're going to be bringing in a lot of actuarial and statistical terms to this discussion. And I think that's what makes astrology, or I think it was one of the things that, that upset me, and I see some of my friends that also upsets, is when people meet us and they say, oh, what year are, or what month are you born in? Or what, you know, your date of birth. And you say, oh, you know, 15th of December. And they're like, oh, you're a Sagittarius. Uh, therefore, you're this, 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 and that. And I remember I get, you know, and, I, and maybe I'm not alone in this. Like I said, I've, I've had a few friends. You've also been a little bit irritated by, I guess, the personalities linking up with the star signs. Because it's like, don't define me by a single data point, okay? A single data point that I personally had no influence over. I didn't determine my, my date of birth, you know, so please don't base my personality or your entire understanding of me on that piece of information, which I had no control over. You know, if you ask me something like, oh, Michael, what's your favorite color? And I say blue, and then you say, oh, okay, based on blue, you're a happy person, you're a smart person, you're a this person. I can then be like, well, okay, cool. At least I chose the color blue. It's still a single data point, which still makes me uncomfortable that so much information is being inferred from it. However, at least I had some agency in determining what that information was. Whereas when it's simply a date of birth, I feel as if, you know, I'm just kind of, <laughs> it's, it's almost the opposite of, of, you know, like the religious story, which places so much agency on the individual. You know, the whole idea is that we got kicked out of, of paradise because we have free will and we have, you know, the divine spark of God and we're able to do so much. And, you know, every decision is either good or bad and there's all this meaning attached to it. And then you come away from religion outside and you've got viewpoints of, you know, nihilism, that there is no such thing as meaning or there is no such thing as good and bad and moralities. Uh, you know, it's, it's all relative based on culture. And, you know, it, it's such a stark contrast. And like I say, it, it's almost nauseating to even just imagine yourself in that type of, of structure because it feels so flimsy, whereas religion you know, tends to give you quite a, a rigid structure, especially, you know, a religion like, uh, like Christianity 
that has, you know, can trace its way all the way through from Judaism. And it's, you know, been around for, for quite, a, quite a long time now. And there's been a lot of writing and a lot of philosophy that's gone into to strengthen, you know, its foundations and apologetics that have gone into, you know, provide reasons where at times it feels like it can be very much a, a paradox. But coming back to, to astrology, like I say, it was, it was very, very uncomfortable from my perspective that so much was being determined based on a single data point. But then I thought, well, hold on, let me think of it from the other person's point of view. And I think this is what makes astrology so attractive, is that, hey, as an individual, look how much information I can know about people based on a single piece of information, which not many people are going to try and hide. If anything, it's quite public knowledge. Like on on your Facebook profile, you've got your name, you've got your date of birth, and your relationship status. Like those are like the three things people go in and and used to look at back in the day. So it was very widely um, available information. And with a single piece of information, I now at least know something about a person. Now, whether that information is right or wrong, you know, we can defer that judgment to a later stage. It just gives me a lot of comfort if straight away I'm like, oh, okay, I'm dealing with the Sagittarius. Okay. You know, I've eliminated a lot of the unknown because Let's admit, doubt is irritating. Not knowing is frustrating. So if I can take a single piece of data and create, you know, a whole picture of who this person is, like I say, whether it's right or wrong is irrelevant in the sense of the comfort that it's giving me as that doubt is being removed. Like I say, doubt might be removed and you could be wrong. Um, And this is why I think scientists are like, you know, this is a pseudoscience. This stuff doesn't hold any hold any weight. But on the other hand, again, it is psychologically um, very calming for someone to use astrology in determining the personalities of people based purely on their their date of birth. It's like they can instantly have this framework on where to place people. And also the thing with astrology is you've got all these different star signs. They're giving you all these different personality traits. You can learn quite a bit about a bit about humans. You can be like, oh. Humans are sometimes this, humans are sometimes this, humans are sometimes that. And I think the interesting thing about astrology is that, I mean, if you were to pick up a different horoscope and read the personality of a different horoscope, you will identify with a lot of those, those things because I think a lot of them are, are common or they're vaguely written enough or they're very attractive things that we want to see ourselves have. So it is possible, I remember picking up mine for for Scorpio and being like, okay, cool, I actually can identify with a bunch of these things. Um, and like I said, I'm not yet to, you know, to knock uh, astrology. I think other people have, have done that uh, better than, than what I potentially could be. Um, but like I said, on the other hand, there is, there is some, you know, I, I like to take things seriously, especially things that maybe other people are very quick to to dismiss and let's say we we look at something like uh astrology you know i i, I ask myself and i'm like well is there any truth like does the date of your birth influence your your personality and i guess if you look at when you're born when you're born determines what season you're born in and, you know, you could have a, a winter baby, a spring baby, an autumn baby, you know, or a summer baby. And I wonder if being born in a different temperature might have different psychological impacts. For instance, maybe if you're born in the winter, your mother holds you more for, for warmth. Okay, now I, <laughs> I don't want to get too much into, into that kind of stuff because, you know, I do have a lot of ignorance in, in childbearing and, and I guess the impact that seasons would have on it. But it could be, you know, the season could influence um, the child. And I guess a way to maybe test this with astrology is to see, let's say I'm a Sagittarius and the, the two star signs on either side, you know, do I feel, you know, are there, are there more similarities between those two than the one, you know, on the, on the opposite side? Um, or like, let's say six, six months apart. Then, but I guess yeah. Then this this raises the interesting question: is 
wouldn't the, there be different star signs for Southern Hemisphere babies and Northern Hemisphere? Because not only, I guess, are we seeing different stars, because, you know, one we're looking uh, this way and the other one we're looking, we're looking that way, um, but also, you know, the seasons are, are also then, you know, reversed. So, and I think a lot of astrology is based on Northern Hemisphere, um, you know, kind of, like I know the Europeans and China and, and all of these kind of places had it, whereas I don't think, yeah, in the Southern Hemisphere we had that much. I mean, I think, we, you know, all cultures have had some sort of astrological, you know, uh, linkage to their mythology. And even like, say, in Christianity, you know, the stars and celestial objects play an important role um, in, in the grand narrative. But I think, yeah, it's, it's the zodiac, you know, that kind of is, is dominant as the astrology, you know, when we refer to it in, in today's kind of culture. So I wonder if the, the South and the Northern Hemispheres should actually flip, in which case, me being Sagittarius, I'm born in the summer in South Africa, where it's, you know, winter in, in the Northern Hemisphere, and I'm going to see if my, my flipped uh, zodiac sign would be it, or maybe the southern hemisphere should just have its own set because, like I say, we're looking at at a whole different set of uh, <laughs> set of stars. I mean, that was always one thing. I guess this is a very like South African thought, is you know South Africa would put at like the bottom of the world, and I always thought like why are we at the bottom of the world? Like this whole orientation of north and south is is a man made construct. And, you know, if, <laughs> like, it's not wrong to draw the world upside down because, like I say, I don't think there is an orientation in, in the cosmos. Um, you know, if you were to launch a rocket from South Africa and look down on the Earth, it would appear upside, upside down. I don't know, like I say, very, a very South African, Southern Hemisphere thought where we like, why are we at the bottom of the... <laughs> Why are we at the bottom of the world? Why aren't we, why aren't we at the at the top? Um, but the interesting thing is with I guess with astrology and say dates of births, is that I guess they do play quite an important role in our society today. So one thing um, it's and it's weird. It's it's now it's now acting in my favor. And for those of you who've seen my karting vlog, uh, you'll know what I'm talking about. But when I was growing up, it it acted against me. So you know, born 15th of December, and in South Africa, our school year started in, in January. And I remember my mom loves telling the story about how they were thinking about holding me back um, one year. So instead of me going into the class of 1991, you know, they were thinking, okay, maybe you should go in the class of 1992, because, you know, being a December baby, uh, <laughs> you're, you're not as old as kids, and, you know, age at that, at that time, is you know being out by six months can be like ten percent of your your life or something like that. So, I remember she she loves telling the story because they went um, and I did a whole bunch of tests and apparently at age of six I was operating at the intellectual level of a of a nine year old. So they were like, okay, cool, he can go into to class. And you know my mother loves telling this the story. The problem though with the story or or by doing this is that it really ruined me for for sport. Uh, you know, not only was I probably late to the whole puberty game, but being a December baby meant that physically I didn't have as much time to develop as, say, the, the other children. And, you know, there were circumstances where, let's say, you know, having six months on someone at such an early age can give you enough of a physical advantage. I mean, this is why schools, you know, the grade eights don't play with the grade nines and the 10-year-olds the don't play with the 14-year-olds the because age does have quite a big impact on your, your sporting performance. But what tends to happen, and especially since I stayed at the whole, you know, I was at one school my entire life, is that you kind of get boxed. So let's say in grade one or the first year that I'm at a school, the coaches are like, okay, Michael didn't make the first team, he's a second team player. So when the second, third, fourth, you know, all these grades go forward, that kind of starts accumulating, like, okay, no, that's a second year player, and that prior knowledge is kind of imprinted, because you can imagine, as a coach, you don't have the time, or maybe you don't just care enough to reassess every single student, um, you know, for, for the new year, if anything, you want to be like, okay, who was in the first team last year, okay, we're going to 
look and observe these players who was in the second team last year, you know, they're going to start off in the, in the second year. And that can have a little bit of a, of a compounding, um, you know, result. And I think, I think I read this somewhere in Freakonomics where they showed that, yeah, you know, the date of birth of a lot of, you know, NBA players was clustered towards the beginning of the, the start of the year because, of course, that gave them that physical advantage early on, which then got them the attention, and then it became anchored to their personality that, hey, these guys are, you know, the, the champions, and, and they kind of got that further, further attention, and that divide started to, to help. Of course, now with karting, we've got a, an opposite thing happening where if you're born in the year 1991, uh, basically you have to be 32, you can then compete in DD2 Masters. And me being born in December means I'm going to be the youngest for karting. And in karting, it's a weird sport where the younger you are, the quicker you actually are. So I, I now have that, that flip and that advantage back into my place. So if you're keen to follow my karting journey, the vlogs will, will also be out there. Um, but yeah, it's, it's interesting how, I guess, that date of birth there actually is a lot of information that can be drawn from it regarding your sporting uh, career. But whether it's your, your personality, maybe you know, that can then impact it in, in some regards. But I still think it's based more on how cultures and societies are structured rather than you know, on just the, the, cos, the cosmos. Um, and let's maybe like talk a little bit about, about astronomy for the the next nine minutes because try and keep these vlogs to you know 30 30 minutes at at a time so coming to to astronomy it's interesting that it's called the cosmos okay the cosmos uh it's the greek word for for order whereas the greek word for disorder is chaos so they didn't look up at the stars and say oh it's chaos they looked up at the stars and they said oh it's cosmos you know it's it's ordered and they believed that the universe followed a set you know, amount of rules and structures and, and that kind of stuff. And of course it does, but you know, with later discoveries and later technology, we've discovered it's not as simple as we, as we thought. And of course, one of the big changes that we made from the Western world point of view was when we went from a geocentric worldview to a heliocentric worldview. And psychologically, I think that was a big impact for our collective consciousness because suddenly we went from going we're the center of the universe okay which makes sense from a christian idea point of view you know god made us god sent his son to die for us therefore it makes sense that we are the center and you know we had this whole structure that played into the christian worldview suddenly with the heliocentric worldview it kind of supported the whole nihilistic worldview where it's like, well, we're just a little blue speck and, you know, our sun isn't even the center. You know, there's this huge solar system, this huge uh, galaxy, this huge universe. And, you know, we're so tiny and insignificant. And like I say, the current world or the current cosmological view does lean more towards nihilism. And I bring up the whole religious thing because people love to make this claim that, oh, religion religion held back science and they give the whole story of galileo um, with the whole heliocentric geocentric worldview but what many people fail to realize is that the church back then especially the catholic church they were a political institution a scientific institution and a religious institution i mean they still are today but today they're primarily just a religious institution a little bit of politics and a little little bit of science but back then they were almost like the main political force and like i say the main uh, scientific force as as well very quickly with with the politics is that what would happen is this is after uh, the dark ages we had charlemagne where charlemagne kind of makes an agreement with the pope that they would have this kind of alliance where the pope would say okay this is the king. This is the king who has the divine right. So why should we all obey the king? Because God appointed the king. And who's the representative of God? It was, you know, the Pope or the whole Catholic Church. So the whole idea was that if you didn't believe in, you know, Catholicism, then you became a bit of a political rebel. And the king was like, mm, I only want religious subjects 
because if you're not religious, it means you don't you know, approve of my authority. So kings would kind of be very, very harsh on people who weren't religious because it had a political potential fallout for them. So we see that Catholicism has a very important role to play in, in politics. But of course, with a lot of political power, they become, a, you know, they become corrupt in various areas. And you have this guy called Martin Luther who comes in with the Reformation. And Martin Luther, though he was a Catholic monk himself, he was backed by a lot of the Northern European um, princes who were like, you know what, we don't want to be under Catholic control. If Martin Luther can come here and show that the Catholic Church themselves aren't religious, then we can undermine their authority to appoint world leaders, and therefore the leaders um, that they've appointed you know, can be disposed of, new leaders can put in, and we don't have to answer to the Catholic Church. So Luther gets backed by, by an army, by a lot of political might, and this is where this Reformation starts to come in. And they start having a bit of a smear campaign. And one of the things that Luther does is he sees that it was a Catholic monk called Nicholas Coponius who had written about the heliocentric worldview. Okay? This heliocentric worldview book had been published by the Catholic Church and for like the first 60 years, no one cared. No one really cared about this book. It was only when Luther starts coming in and saying, ha, look at the Catholics. They've created the scientific literature that goes against, and it was Luther who put forward this whole idea of, you know, I think there's this verse in Joshua where God says, and the sun stood still. And, and Luther's like, see, God said the sun will stand still, not the earth will stand still. And, you know, he uses this as his basis of attack to say that, hey, look at the Catholics. They're not biblical. This is another example of them deviating from the faith, and therefore we should follow me um, and the Reformation rather than being Catholic. And with the printing press, Luther has got a wide, wide audience and can reach all of Europe. And so this becomes a huge, huge political problem for the Catholics because it's like, oh my gosh, how do we explain to the masses, to the peasants, this entire heliocentric worldview? Because the heliocentric worldview made a lot of sense. And that was mainly because of this one planet called Mars. Mars was doing this thing called retrograde motion, where sometimes it would move in the sky, and then it would move the opposite direction. And sometimes it would be bright, and sometimes it would be dim. And Coponius showed that the heliocentric worldview, which he didn't create, he even says, you know, the ancient Greeks had this whole idea, and Aristotle told them, oh, you know, that's, it's wrong, and Aristotle pushed for the geocentric worldview. But back in, you know, around 300 BC, around that time, the heliocentric worldview was put forward because, of course, people could see this retrograde motion of Mars and how else do you explain it? And it was very important that you knew the position of Mars from an astrological point of view because, you know, if you could say Mars was over here, it means we were going to win the battle. Or if Mars was over there, your love life was going to blossom. And astronomy and astrology were very, very closely tied. So it was very important that you could predict where Mars was going to be. But with the geocentric worldview, it was very difficult to determine where Mars is going to be. A heliocentric worldview could very easily explain mathematically where Mars was going to be. And Nicholas Coponius puts forward this idea. And like I say, the Catholic Church, it's not like, oh my gosh, they published it and, and everybody started to freak out. It was like, no, they were like, okay, cool. This is a cool scientific theory. Um, of course, Coponius hadn't explained one very, very important thing. And it's like, well, if the earth is moving around the sun, why don't all the stars move? And that would be something known as the stellar parallax, which would only kind of be like figured out hundreds of years later with new technology for people to determine actually the stars do move. It's just they seem so because they're so far away, it seems like they don't. And therefore, you know, we don't have um, it doesn't appear like the stars are, are moving where actually they they are. Now I'm coming to the last minute, but I think let me let me let me borrow a little bit more time and just I guess finish up the whole the whole story. Because I guess this is where good old Galileo kinda kinda comes in. So this is the scene, okay? The Catholic Church, they've got the Ottomans, you know, invading Italy, coming in from uh East, you know, they've taken over Constantinople, they're pushing up, I mean they've almost made their way up to, to Venice during this whole kind of time. So 
The Ottomans are right on the Catholics, okay? So the whole of Christendom is being threatened. You've got Martin Luther who's coming in and he's literally splitting Christianity in half once again. Because remember, this had happened 500 years ago with the Great Schism, with the, the whole Orthodox kind of, you know, separating from, from the Catholics. So the Catholics don't want to have another breakup. But Luther's coming in, not only is he saying a whole bunch of stuff against their religious practices, but he's also showing their scientific things to be anti-biblical from his perspective. So the Catholic Church is dealing with this propaganda attack. And that's when Galileo kind of enters the scene. And Galileo, what he did is he created this super cool telescope. So the telescope had, someone had submitted a patent for the telescope like a year before, I think like 1608. And Galileo kind of makes his cool one in 1609, which was a lot stronger, a lot more powerful. He observes the rings around Saturn, the moons going around Jupiter. He's like, well, the fact that moons are going around Jupiter, it means not everything revolves around the Earth. And therefore, if not everything revolves around the Earth, maybe the Earth isn't at the center. And he's like, if we look at Coponius, who, shame by this time, had been dead for like the past 70 years. Um, he's like, well, maybe, maybe that whole model has got some weight towards it. But of course, the Catholic Church comes in and they say, Galileo, listen here, like, one, this is super awkward because if you keep pushing this scientific view, the masses are going to think that we're not biblical. And we can't really justify to them say that this actually is the correct worldview because they're all going to come back to us and say, why don't the stars move? You know, it's, it's like trying to convince everybody um, <laughs> You know, back in the day, like, how do you, we can all see the stars at night. We can all see the stars at night and they're not moving. So how do you explain that? And Galileo couldn't. He couldn't. And instead, what he does is he starts attacking the Pope personally. And again, this is not what the papacy needed at the time. They already were trying to deal with, you know, Luther coming and saying that they weren't uh, religious enough. Now they've got Galileo coming in and saying that they're not scientific enough. And there's like, you know, the Ottomans that are threatening their, their political situation. So the Catholic Church was in the situation where they said, you know, what, Galileo, you do not have enough scientific evidence to change the fundamental theory. And therefore, you know, we're going to shut you down. Of course, we want to be seen in the good eyes of the people, so we're going to also throw in the, the whole biblical argument in there as well. But the main reason was the stellar parallax, rather than because, like I say, it's very, very loose Bible verses that you can try and try and take to support a geocentric uh, worldview. So, I mean, you can even take Bible verses and try to push forward a flat earth. You know, the Bible, especially when it talks about the world and all these things there is a lot of creative language and all these type of things and uh you know theologians can can kind of twist it to, to to mean what they want it to mean so what they came in is they said listen here um you don't have enough scientific proof and you know they placed the bible argument for for the masses but of course the whole of science going forward i mean and we see this there was even this other guy called bruno who got burnt at the stake for denying, you know, the, the Trinity, Jesus being God. He supported like what's something known as the Arian heresy, um, which was the reason for his, yeah, very unfortunate, uh, you know, so much for free speech back in the day. Back then it was very dangerous to have novel ideas. Um, but, you know, he was kind of put to death for, for those things, not for his cosmology, because Bruno also supported uh, the Coponius idea. Um, and he was running around at the same time as, as Galileo. And people love to point towards him and say, listen, see, they killed Bruno because of his scientific worldview. They killed Galileo because of his scientific worldview. You know, the church has held back, um, you know, scientific progress. Where it's like interesting where you kind of figure out the whole story and you see that that's not necessarily, you know, the case. Um, but we have gone past my my 30 minute marker. So... Let me know if you guys enjoy this. We can always have, have a part two. But what I love about astronomy is not only, you know, because I guess after this whole scenario, we get, you know, Newton and Haley, which I have made videos on where they contributed so much to astronomy. 
and to actuarial science because the mathematics that is needed for both schools, um, you know, it's, it's, it's the pure math. And it was actually the reason why we needed maths was because there was so much money in determining where these various celestial objects were going to be placed because people, you know, believe that their personalities and their, their futures and their fortunes depended on it. So I guess to conclude this whole big long vlog, it's that astrology, funnily enough, financed astronomy and religion defended the scientific method of we only change something once we have complete proof um, rather than being, you know, just a, a hurdle or, or a blocker in, in innovation. But it's so crazy how the, the narrative of today, you know, when you read scientific articles and all of that, is they love to push forward this notion that, you know, ooh, astrology is just pseudoscience and religion has just, you know, been a, been a blocker and, and hold, holds us back. Whereas when you look at the history, you realize that these three things are a lot more intertwined and a lot more complicated and a lot more interesting than one could, could ever imagine. But anyway, we're five minutes over time, so I'm going to wrap this up. Thank you so much for listening, and I'll see you guys next month for another vlog on philosophy.